Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you today? I am doing well, thank you. Good. Well, I'm I'm going to do the introduction thing because I realized I really think I need to do that. So I'm Allison. I'm the technical services librarian at Fairfield County District Library. This is Lattes with Librarians. And today with me, I have Audrey, who is the assistant youth services coordinator at the library. You may know her or um, be familiar with her from our comments section because she comments on the behalf of the library, but also as herself. She has great recommendations and lots of knowledge about uh, a lot about children's material, but about all kinds of material. Um, and so this is her first time appearing on Lattes with Librarians. So Audrey, Hello. do you have anything to, to add to my robust introduction? Just when I'm commenting as myself, I show up under my nickname as Odd. So if anyone's <laughs> about, I never saw an Audrey, it's, I, my nickname's A-U-D, it's Odd. So. And I, this morning, the mug that I'm drinking out of, I picked this uh, mug, well, you know, if you can see, it has an A on it, but I, I picked this one because we both have an uh, initial of A. So it was like, I don't know, <laughs> for both of us. That's very pretty. I, I actually don't have a mug handy. Um, I did drink coffee this morning. I don't usually do that, but I do have a mason jar full of water. A mason jar full of water counts. And honestly, for some of us, 1030 is a strange time to be drinking coffee. You've already drank it. And if you drink more, it will be disastrous is sometimes what happens to some of us. Um, so we accept we accept all beverages or no beverage on lattes with librarians. Um, so I was excited to have you on today for lots of reasons. But one reason was because um, you well, we started talking about books, as we often do, and it was just it, like I wanted to know what you read as a kid because Leah and I have talked about that before and I was wondering what you read growing up and if we overlapped at all um, and just tell us some about what your reading habits were as a kid. Did you read a lot? Did you read a little? Because some people think that if you work in a library that means like you've always loved reading from the time you were born and that may not necessarily be true. I have always been a book lover. I was, my family called me the little weed it girl for a while because when I was really, really little, I'd wander up to relatives and I'd put a book in their lap and go weed it. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so I was reading by the time I, before my fifth birthday, I actually started, my birthday's in late September. I actually started kindergarten before, when I was four going on five because I could already yeah. know. And my preschool teachers were like, please don't send her back here. She'd be yeah. so bored. Um, oh. So um, later on down the road, I homeschooled for a while. Things got complicated. I did wind up repeating a year, but still I started early because I could already read. So. Yeah, so you've been reading from the beginning. From the beginning. I've always been a huge reader. That being said, the um, book that turned me into a kid who liked reading independently mm -hmm. into um, a book a day bibliophile was the Red Wall series by Brian Jakes, which has oh. been mentioned on the show before. Yes. I was so excited the day that that got mentioned. I think yes. I was screaming in all caps in the comments. Yes. Um, and then from there, it was C.S. Lewis. It was Lloyd Alexander. It was uh, Tamara Pierce. Mm -hmm. um, I loved those books a whole, whole lot. Um, and then just everything under the sun. And then everything. And that's the thing. I, I'm the same way. Like I can say these are the books that like I devoured or that I read over and over or that I always got the next one. But it also was literally anything. Anything yes. I would yeah. read. Um, you When you talk about Redwall, we have mentioned that on here before. And I think Judith commented something about the audiobooks, or maybe it was because I was saying an audiobook got checked out to me and I didn't realize it. I did start listening to those. I started listening to Salomon Dastron recently. I just kind of picked one. And I think that's how, you it. It. that's how they pronounce it in the audiobook. So I'm going with it. Oh, that's, I, we always said it Salamandastron. But that's what I was talking to someone else. And that's what they said as well. Who knows? But I will tell you, I did not know his last name was pronounced Jake's either until I heard the audio book. That one we knew because someone that was a connection to us heard an interview somewhere. Okay. He was very, yeah. very British. So he was very insistent on the British, not the French pronunciation. It's not French. Well, and see that. So I heard that. So if you, the audio book, it, it, it is worth the recommendation that Ju I think Judith gave, and I'll recommend it here. It is a full cast recording. It is. 
I cannot tell you how hard they just go for it. When people yell or bellow or sob or cry out, it's full on. Like sometimes it almost would just make me laugh because I was just like, it's just, you know, I know, I know I would have loved listening to it as a kid and I'm loving listening to it now. And the other thing is when they sing, because there's a lot of like sitting around singing songs about Martin the Warrior or whoever, um, or even just like the little dormouse is singing a song to himself. They always add like a, sounds like a, like a lyre or something. They always add instrumentation to it. And sometimes there's even like multiple voices and stuff. So um, it's, it's been really entertaining. So thank you, Judith, for the recommendation. And anyone else, those are, I think they're but mostly- do, do they do the mole accents? I don't know if I've encountered a mole yet, but I'm guessing because everyone has an accent. The Dormouse has, everyone has like a different accent. Some of them even difficult to understand because there was like a, a reptile of some kind, there was a lizard and he would do this sound like at the beginning and end of it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like if I were reading it, I could piece it out, but I'm like, I can't, I'll just assume what you're saying. I think I can still get the gist of it, but um, so I'm assuming that the the mole accent is, in, is intact. That's kind of awesome. That yeah, they're, they're, they're on overdrive. I'm not Sorry. super into, uh, like I'm a huge proponent of audiobooks. Mm -hmm. They're just not my, except for car rides. And even then I'm not a linear reader and it's Red Wall's fault actually because there's a lot of dying in Redwall and they always make me cry. And so I would get X far into a book and then I'd need to know who died just to be prepared. Aww. So now I, I still would sob like a baby. That's beside the point. <clears throat> so now I am just not a linear reader. I get about a third of the way through a book. I start making guesses and then I read the last couple of chapters. Okay. And now I'm a children's librarian and I read all of these reviews and I start making guesses based off of reviews and but the books come in and I, I look at them and I'm like, I'm not actually sure I want to read this. So I read the last couple chapters first before I even check them out. And I, I deal with anxiety. Mm -hmm. I know that I didn't have it so much as a kid, uh, like bursts of it as a kid, but as an adult, it's a thing I deal mm -hmm. with. It, the suspense does not help me. You can still well, appreciate the story without mm -hmm. taking the suspense element out of it. You can still find out what happens and then read the story without that looming sense of anxiety. Yeah, it actually so, helps yeah. me more appreciate it because I'm not sitting there going, the right. whole thing. Yes, so I can get more into it because I'm not living with dread. That's a good idea. Um, and just, just to read the comments, Liz says that the mole accent is very hard to even read in the book sometimes as a kid. So I'm guessing it was preserved in the audio. And then Andrea asked, they're on overdrive. Yes, the audiobooks for Redwall are, are on overdrive. And I noticed when I was like going to check one out, um, Redwall, I had to place a hold for, but all the other ones, there were so many that I didn't have to place a hold for. So I think that the other ones are recorded books and are currently always available. So I don't even think you need to wait for those. But I think the first one, if you want to start with Redwall, but the thing about Redwall is there's like prequels and sequels and it, it doesn't really matter where you begin at all. You can just I, kind of Yeah, I would recommend starting with Redwall first. Like read the first one first because it introduces like the mythos. And then That's I would and I would read Moss Flower second because it is the ultimate prequel that introduces the rest of the mythos. And if you read that's those true. two first, after that's that, true. I felt like I could pick up anywhere, but that's because I was already familiar with. I knew what Redwall Abbey was, and I understood what all of was going on. So you're right; it probably is better to start with Redwall, um, in which case you may have to be on hold for a week or two. But yeah, I don't think the hold list was very long. Um, but after Redwall and then after Moss Flower, you can read them in any order that you want. That's how I always recommend it to people in my okay. children's department. And then either Matimeo or Matimio. We'll have to listen to it and find out. No, that is technically the third one and it is the immediate sequel to Redwall. So it does make sense to read that one third, but mm -hmm. you don't have to. And then a lot of them go back in time. And so they're like prequels. So you recognize the stuff like Martin the Warrior and things from reading other books, but they're technically taking place before Redwall even happened. So yeah, Martin Martin the Warrior will make you cry. It's a good one, but it'll make you cry. Um, yeah, it will make you cry. But Martin the Warrior in particular, ah, oh, that one will make you cry. The I only one in the whole series that I despised as a child was Outcast of Redwall. But I don't know that I've read that one actually. Um, 
it had a little too much death and I thought yeah. most of them were unnecessary. And so I didn't, a lot of them you're like, oh, tragic death, but good. And it's okay. That one I was just like, nope, this is- Was it getting into like Game of Thrones territory? Is he becoming like- <laughs> But I, there's also like 25 books in the series, and I don't care for most of the last 10 or so of them. But I was also outgrowing it at that point. Right. I know. And that's, that's kind of what happened to me. Like, I read up to a certain point, and then I didn't. I just, I was moving on to other things. I was in the young adult fiction section of the library at that point or whatever. Um, I was in my 20s, so <laughs> my obsession lasted a good that's long time. <laughs> Um, did you read, um, it sounds like we did read a lot of the same stuff. Did you read, um, ever get into Animorphs? I did not. I think. Speaking of more, series. That was more sci-fi and it's not that I was anti-sci-fi. It's that I was hardcore fantasy. Okay. Like we read, me and my friends read, um, and McCaffrey in seventh grade, which was a little young. Like looking back <laughs> post Me Too movement, there's some problematic <laughs> elements in the Anne McCaffrey books for sure. Um, we are all unharmed is all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like Animorphs was one of those things that I was just on the cusp of being a little too old for. Like probably. I was just on the cusp of being too old for Pokemon when it first came out too. Oh, like I was yeah. at the tail end of being too old. Um, Harry wow. Potter, for a while there, I was almost the exact same age as Harry Potter. Yeah. And that was really fun. Um, yeah. Though I think the last Harry Potter when I was in college. So we, lot, we, we wound up not being in sync at the mm. end of the day, but like for a little while there we were. Right, yeah, and Harry Potter is its own thing. I don't even touch that when it comes to what books did you read as a kid because that was an entire life-consuming situation for me. Yeah. So that's not even what I don't even I don't even think about that when I talk about this. I didn't get super into Harry Potter. Like I liked them, but I didn't actually get super into them until after about the fourth book. Okay, yeah, I felt like that's when the literary quality kind of jumped a notch. Well, but the first three came out without as much fanfare. The fourth one had an actual, well, they probably, they all had release dates, but the fourth one had an actual release date that was kind of built up. I purchased it at Kroger um, and, uh, or rather my parents did, but th that was the type, that was the kind, I mean, they had a stack of them at Kroger, which they would not have had probably of those other ones. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was about the time when everything really started ramping up, but I can't, we won't talk about anything else if we do that, if we go down this road. No, so we something else. I just wondered about Animorphs because that was one of those series. This is this is my copy of the original, the first Animorphs. Um, and I also read the series called, you wouldn't have since it's sci-fi, but I was gonna throw it out into the, the world because I don't have any of my copies anymore. I got rid of them. Um, it was called Replica and it was about this girl that was a clone. And it was the first one was called Amy number seven. And I remember going and I would get those at Walden books. I would go and I would get the next one. I would get the next one as they came out. Um, I don't know the author, Amy number seven, and she was a clone and all these things unfolded from there. The other thing, again, you're not a sci-fi reader. So I but, am now, I, but I wasn't then. Yeah, um, I was this book, The Transall Saga by Gary Paulson. Have you ever read that? I read a lot of Gary Paulson. He is uh, hatchet fame. Yeah. Um, and the Transall Saga is a is a straight sci-fi type of story um, about a boy who's on a solo camping trip in the desert. Um, it turns into a terrifying and thrilling odyssey when a mysterious beam of light transports him to what appears to be another planet. As he searches for a pathway back to his own time on Earth, he must make a new life in a new world. And this one just, I hadn't read much sci-fi up until this point. Um, outside of, if this goes in there, Neil Shesterman. Mind quakes. I read this. This is like really worn. I read that over and over again. So I read a lot of stuff like that that was like surprising, like what's going to happen next and something that's out of this, that's set in this world, but then something crazy happens is a lot of what I read over and over again, I think. Um, I've read a lot of fantasy, like I said, and um, and that actually segued me into historical fiction mm -hmm. more than anything else. The one series that kind of broke the mold and 
and it's actually still ongoing, um, which crossed all kinds of lines, was Diane Duane's Young Wizard series. Which I'm actually, not with that. And I don't understand why it's not as popular as it should be. Um, mm -hmm. The first book actually came out in the 80s, and um, she has revamped it. And uh, she started writing it again in the 90s, in the 2000s, something like that. I don't know. There's... Um, I actually have one sitting right in front of me. It's one of the oh, no. ones. Um, this okay. is coincidental, actually. I didn't realize it was sitting on my my dining my um coffee table. You're in the middle of reading it. James Wizard's play. It's book number ten. I feel like there's um maybe eleven or twelve of them out now. But this is one of the most recent ones. I think there's one after this, which means I have to buy it because I don't have it yet. Um, but it's it's really good, but it crosses that line between fantasy and sci-fi. And the idea is, is that um, wizards are slowing down the eventual death or entropy of the universe by basically being diplomats between different species and trying to avert natural disasters and stuff like that. And they have a universal language called the speech that they use to do it. And it's really cool. Um, like there's an offshoot series where cats are the wizards, for example. And it's cool because it includes a lot. It's very inclusive of a lot of different religions. Mm -hmm. That's and cool. the main character, one of the ma two main characters, and this came out in the 80s, was a Hispanic boy who skipped a year because he was so smart. Um, like, I don't feel like you got that as a main character. Mm -hmm very often yeah. in the eighties. Like even now in children's literature, we're still pushing really hard to try to get more diversity in our literature. Yeah. So yeah. the that she loves choose your own adventure books. Those are also really, really awesome. Oh, I read so many of those. That was one that the library I, I would just I would go to that rack at the library and just look for is there one I haven't read? Is there one I haven't read? Especially if you've got struggling or reluctant readers at home, choose your own adventures are great because they also chunk up the sec they're less daunting to read than traditional novels. I mean, I would not hand this to a struggling or reluctant reader. It's thick. Right, but if they can just, that you know you're not gonna read the whole thing straight through. You're gonna read a few pages and then you get to go somewhere else and then you get to go somewhere else. I agree. And also when you talked about um, fantasy leading you into historical fiction, that's something that I feel like we don't talk about a lot, but like when you talk about the elements of appeal when you read like fantasy, that world building is really similar to the world building of historical fiction. And you might not think, like you think of someone reading about like wizards and elves and stuff, and what would they have in common with someone who reads historical fiction? Well, some people who read fantasy are reading for that world building. And there's not much different except just the technicalities of moving into a different historical time period rather than a different fantasy time period. I studied medieval history in college. so. <laughs> For me, this really sparked off a lifelong fascination with castles and stuff. So yeah, that's true. There's also that connection. Different time periods in history, maybe kind of, and and it also, uh, I think there's a sci-fi, fantasy, and historical fiction kind of can all combine with like steampunk types yep. of books because steampunk is a lot of like sciencey stuff, but they're also it's very easy to start pulling in a little bit of magic, and then the next thing you know, you don't know where to put it on the shelf. <laughs> And that's one of the things that I love about graphic novels. I'm forcing Let's a segue. Segue. Let's segue. Go ahead. ahead. Um, and I'm actually going to pull out one of the books that I brought that I wanted to talk about that just came out. It's called Beetle and the Hollow Bones. Um, oh. Sorry, there's a horrible glare. That's fine. I, we can, I can see it, mostly. This came out this year. Also, Mary had one more thing about uh, Choose Your Own Adventures, which is that uh, they can also gamify reading, which is absolutely true. It also gives you more control over the book. So it makes it a less passive experience. So again, for reluctant or struggling readers, like, yes, 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 yes. Choose your own right. adventures. Um, yeah, do it. Um, yeah. Beetle in the Hollow Bones, it's by Elisa Lane. And uh, I'm horrible at names and pronouncing them. Me so too, me too. I always just feel like, oh, I hope I did it. <laughs> so the main character in this is a goblin named Beetle. Mm -hmm. And her best friend is this little pink ghost named Blob Ghost, who is gender neutral, which is awesome. Um, and her former best friend is named Cat or Katarina, who is actually like a skeleton cat. I'm trying Ooh. to find a picture now. So there we go. 
Oh, and I love that it's this like Halloween town sort of Tim Burton Nightmare Before Christmas esque. But look at the color palette. Yeah, and it's, it's dark actually at all. yeah. I got this for my nephew actually um, a few months ago. And he loved it. Um, and the plot is fabulous. The world building is amazing. Um, That's awesome. And the storyline is is really really good. They've got to save the mall where Blob Ghost ha is ha stuck haunting, and you know there's the bad guy that they have to defeat. There's a little bit of a mystery. There's exploring while they're because of course the mall has a labyrinthine basement. My favorite character is probably Hester, the custodian, um, which I appreciate sounds random. She's a side character who shows up for literally two seconds. Uh huh. Like, She's in maybe four panels, but she's like this giant bug looking thing. <laughs> I um, love that. And at first you think really she's aging. shown up. Well, at first you think she's shown up to eat them. And then she's just, no, she's just Hester the custodian. And she's actually really sweet. Um, so I love any book that sort of subverts your expectations like that. Um, yeah. And I yeah. feel like the great thing about, I'm sorry, I'm running you over. <laughs> no, you're fine. I just love books that, um, there we go. Hester the Custodian. I oh just, my gosh. Oh, oh, she's very weird. I just I love, love books that you don't see what's coming next. Like um, Ben Hatke, who does Zeta the Space Girl, does a phenomenal job with that. Also, I love his books because they skew young. Like Zeta is like eight or nine years old and it's sci-fi. And it's really hard to get sci-fi starring young girl kids, but it's also so good that older kids like it too. And then the sequel series is Mighty Jack and they're more like 12 or 13 in that one. And same universe and they're so good. And the artwork's phenomenal. So think, yeah, that's a good point you make about having a kid who's like eight or nine in it. It does seem like, it seems like kids are often more like in the 11, 12 range in books. And I remember that even when I was a kid reading, like I would read books and the kid was always older than me because by the time you get to, I'd, I don't know, like, especially if you're at a certain reading level, the kids are going to be older than you. And the kids, the only kids that were your age were in like a picture book or something like that. And it's nice to have graphic novels as kind of a transition period there where you can kind of probably meet people at their reading level with a kid who's their own age, maybe a little bit easier. Well, the reason actually why publishers do that is because the average kid likes to read up a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So broadly speaking, if the main character is in sixth or seventh grade, then the target audience for that is someone who is a grade or two below. Okay. And so I guess that is how I was reading. I was always reading about kids older than me, but because that's the most age that, well, most kids are there okay reading about kids that are their own grade but a lot of kids prefer to read up a year or two. Okay. So if the main character is in sixth or seventh grade, then they are aiming for like fifth, sixth, seventh grade readers. Okay. Okay. Because that's just very few kids are actually keen on reading about kids younger than them. Right. They have surprisingly delicate self-confidence in certain regards and it is absolute social murder to be seen as reading a baby book okay That's another reason why graphic novels are the best because if you have someone who is a struggling or reluctant reader the last thing they want to do is bring a book into school that everyone else was reading three years ago or two years ago or heaven forbid even last year like magic treehouse is an excellent series however it's really if you're an advanced reader you can read it by the end of like i've known some kindergartners reading it i feel like that's unnecessary if you are that's great but like it's a first or second grade reading level book and so if you're a third or fourth grade like if and you love it then go for it but if you're already feeling fragile self-confidence that's not what you're wanting to bring in to school. If you've already got it stuck in your head, oh, reading is hard, reading's not for me, you don't need added social pressure. But the great thing about graphic novels is that they provide context clues in the picture and they're easier to decipher what they mean. But you get all the same benefits from reading a graphic novel that you get from reading a traditional novel. 
as I like to say, there's no such thing as a book that's going to make you a worse reader. No. And, and graphic novels have amazing vocabulary. You get all of the same benefits from reading the dialogue, from the plot, from the character development, from the setting. Um, they're really, really good. You will become a better reader from reading the graphic novels. Also, you were showing off Animorphs earlier. Animorphs actually just got a reboot and they're coming out as graphic novels. I had no idea. That was just a coincidence. Yeah, Animorphs is coming out as graphic novels. Goosebumps coming out as graphic novels. I Survived has just started coming out as graphic novels. Wings of Fire is a super popular kid series about dragons. Um, I think we're up to about book five just came out as a graphic novel. Book four or five just came out as a graphic novel. Um, and that's besides the books that are graphic novels that are just super popular, like Dogman, Amulet. Um, so these are books that are more accessible to kids who find reading traditional novels to be daunting or difficult um, that they can bring to school and they're just reading the same stuff that the kids their age are reading yeah. and they're practicing their reading in their leisure time and they're getting better at reading because the only thing that's going to make a kid a better reader at, after a certain point is reading practice. Right. So right nothing's going to make a kid read more than them reading something they like so just hand them graphic novels for the love of pete just if that's right. what they're reading just keep handing they will get better yeah. the more do they remember, do you remember the um the outcry when um captain underpants came out and everyone was like you know captain underpants is just it's worthless, it's trash, kids shouldn't be reading it. But then like on the other hand, you know, librarians and everyone else are saying, no, it's absolutely fine. You know, it's A, reading is reading, B, like calm down. And you know, this is just a fun, engaging, entertaining book. But do, do you remember that? How it was like anti-Captain Underpants for a while? Again, Captain Underpants is another one of those things that came out just a couple years, mm -hmm. just a few years too old for it. My, my younger yeah. cousins loved it. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, I kind of yeah, remember. It came out for younger for me too, but I also have a younger sibling. So um, mm -hmm. he read Captain Underpants. And I just, I remember being vaguely aware of that, of like people like putting it down as like not good reading, but there's no such thing as not good reading. And just because you think it's silly that, you know, he's Captain Underpants. And yes, objectively it is very silly, but it's still really fun and engaging. And Dave Pilkey writes plenty of graphic novels these days. That's him, right? Yep. Yeah, he writes plenty of graphic novels now that are also extremely popular. The Dogman books, and he himself has dyslexia. And he himself had a lot of problems in school. And he himself is writing the kind of books that he wanted to read as a kid, but were not widely available. Mm -hmm. And those are books that kids are reading and kids right. are better at reading because of them. Um, so dyslexia is a uh, visual processing disorder or difference um, if you want to know more about it, a really great resource is actually Teen Librarian Toolbox, which is a blog on SLJ, School Library Journal. I'm very sorry, I'm using lingo. Um, School Library Journal website, it's free. Um, and every November, they do stuff for Dyslexia Awareness Month. One of the main contributors to that blog has a daughter with dyslexia. So a lot of what I know about dyslexia, I've read from following links on that mm -hmm. blog. But graphic novels are fabulous for kids with dyslexia because again they can get visual context clues from reading the panels from looking at the pictures but it also chunks up the text smaller in the word bubbles and the thing is is that for a lot of kids and individuals adults with dyslexia reading is physically exhausting to do um and graphic novels makes you less tired to read um, and it's just easier. And it also builds that confidence yeah. and it makes kids more likely to grab a book to read for fun because you build skills, you build a confidence, you get better at doing it. So, um, also a lot of, uh, graphic novels, I feel like are hand lettered. And so there's a lot yeah. of difference between how you do the B's and the P's and, yeah. the, D's and the Q's. I was going to mention that. So that yeah. helps a lot too. Graphic novels are also great if you've got kids who are on the spectrum or who have difficulty maybe identifying um, facial expressions or body language. Um, it's one thing, you know, reading a 
reading fiction improves empathy skills anyway. Graphic novels do the same thing. But when you read the graphic novel, you can see someone says something or does something, and then you can see the person's physical reaction to that, and you can see how their face changes, and you can see how their body language changes. And because it's all in illustrations, it's often a bit exaggerated. And in TV shows, sometimes it goes by really quickly, but in a panel format, you can go as slow as you need to. So it can also really be helpful for kids who need that slowed down yeah. to help learn, oh, their feelings got hurt and they are now angry and they're sad. Like help connect those dots in a more concrete way. Yeah, these are all really, really, really great things. And the, I was I was thinking about the font thing with dyslexia because I know there's fonts that are better for uh, people who have trouble in any way reading, mm -hmm. uh, but with dyslexia. And probably there's some graphic novels that are not great for it, but having mm -hmm. different, having, has probably there's some scrawling um, in some of them, but, um, but probably some of them are really helpful because it's just not that same typeface you're always used to looking at where, the, where things are just, not as you want them to be, but probably like you said, that has to make a difference in some cases. Um, there are exceptions, but a lot of the books in the children's department, a lot of the graphic novels mm -hmm. in the children's department have deliberately very clear font. Yeah, you're right. I probably read a lot more of the adult ones that are like, I'm, I'm like peering at it like, what? Your hand lettering is terrible. <laughs> yeah, um, but for the kids department, like they are actually like, I think they're a little bit more precise on trying to make yes. that. Really. So I have a soapbox that I can go on for days about oh, what beneficial graphic novels are. And I'm going to say just one more. No, go ahead. Um, we, we, we've gone over almost every week the past month. So just, just keep going. I'll just keep going. Um, another benefit to graphic novels is that people are also learning how to read pictures. Mm -hmm. And they're learning how to read and analyze graphics which considering our media heavy world is super important. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that's like a very important literacy skill is learning how to read and critically analyze graphics and media. Yes. So if it's you learn, fun. go ahead. So if you learn how to do that with graphic novels, mm -hmm. you're kind of ahead of the game a little bit. Yeah. So like, yeah. I was putting together my new cat tree the other day and I don't have trouble doing stuff like that. And I don't have trouble putting together Ikea furniture because I did so much Lego as a kid. I know how to follow visual instructions because I learned how to le read Lego instructions because right. I did reading Calvin and Hobbes. I don't have trouble reading graphic novels. Mm -hmm. Funny things, true story. A lot of the grownups that I encounter who don't consider graphic novels to be real reading it's because they don't like reading graphic novels. They have a hard time reading graphic novels. They think it's harder because they weren't allowed or did not have access to comics as a kid. So they don't like them. Yeah. Yeah. Mind because I was reading Calvin and Hobbes at like age seven. Right. Right. I definitely, I know I mentioned that in that other show, me too. Comic strips were kind of what I had available to me. It sounds to me like graphic novels in, for kids and for adults, but graphic novels for kids have all the benefits of reading a regular book, but also maybe even a little bit more when it comes to, like you said, interpreting the pictures and kind of getting that visual visual literacy sort of. And um, even like you said, for kids who might have, who might struggle in other areas, they might be giving them more than they would get from a regular book. So if we take nothing else away from this, because I know we didn't get a chance to talk about most of the books that you brought, which is always what happens. Um, it is that A, they're definitely real reading and B, it is just so worth it. Um, any, any any kid in your life who it seems to have an interest in this, encourage it. Yes, um, I will say that a benefit of traditional novels, because I am mm -hmm. just gonna toss that out there, mm -hmm. um, is that it's sort of like with movies, like you can fit in more details sometimes mm -hmm. with a written book. Mm -hmm. like a than you can with a movie you get more imagination space as well because you don't see yeah. any of it, so you can like build it yourself although some of us and I'm one of those people I'm not super imaginative so when I would read books like that I actually don't picture picture very much I kind of just read it um and I will say when I read books 
basically they all take place in one of like four houses that I've been in. And I just modify that house in my mind because that's the structure that I know. I can't come up with a different house structure in my brain. I can't do it. So I just, that's the house I grew up in. And then it's just kind of like this instead, or this is the other house. And it's kind of like this instead. And it just depends on like how they describe it. Which one does it fit better? That's the one I picture and I redecorate it. <laughs> That's fair. Also, I just feel like um, unless you're willing to make a graphic novel that's this thick, which is hard to do because of all of the drawing, it's easier to make a door stopper novel than a door stopper graphic novel that's got loads of plot. Like I, I do have Percy Jackson graphic novels, but they do tend to come out like Percy Jackson in the Olympians volume one. Yeah. You know, I think, I think those are volumized. I think they are. It is harder to fit a really thick book into a yeah. graphic novel than into a traditional novel. So there are yeah. like, they're just, they're different formats. Right. Like, they're different formats, but I just think there's a lot more advantages to graphic novels than people yeah. may think of. And that they just, they offer they don't offer less, they offer different. So they offer yeah. more than regular books do in other ways, maybe. Yes. Um, Andrea had commented that she had trouble getting started reading when she was a kid and she worked for someone for with a few months, with someone for a few months in fourth grade. And then by fifth grade was able to read Jurassic Park. And so um, I feel like that's a good example too of what you mentioned about confidence and building confidence being very important because probably by working with someone she realized she could do it. She built confidence. And the next thing you know, she's reading Jurassic Park, which is not, not an easy feat. You know, it's, that's a long book. <laughs> so, and a lot of technical words and a lot of things I think that would be overwhelming if you didn't have confidence. I'm also a wimp. So I've read Jurassic Park as an adult. I would not have been able to read that as a fifth grader. I would have been scared out of my gourd. Like I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, can I make one book recommendation? I know we're over. I'm sorry. I'm no bad at I have no recommendations. All I brought were things I read as a kid. So, <laughs> um, Since I know from previous discussions that we do have a lot of Calvin and Hobbes fans who watch this yeah, show. We do. Um, a modern, similar-ish book uh, that's been coming out is this series here, Phoebe and Her oh. Unicorn by Dana Simpson. You wouldn't think looking at the cover that that would be a good um comparison but it is phoebe is about nine years old little girl as you can tell and she befriends a unicorn who is a real unicorn not a stuffed unicorn the marigold heavenly nostrils but their dynamic is similar ish to mm -hmm. calvin and hobbes and it's clever in a similar ish way to calvin and hobbes it's a little less nihilistic um but it's hilarious. And the comments about humanity, about the state of the world, they're, this is adorable. I've actually been getting Phoebe and her unicorn from my dad for Christmases and birthdays for the last few years. He adores them. That is an endorsement of any I've ever heard. If you're getting it for your dad. Yes, I've been getting them for my dad. Um, so I love this series. Uh, and it's, it's a great all ages series, obviously. I'm getting it for. <laughs> so she also, and some of the strips last for a like, I, I hesitate actually to call this one a graphic novel because it, it, it is more like Calvin and Hobbes in that yeah. some of the storylines last for a few pages. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them really are just like a page or two. Yeah. Um, so it is a little bit more of that more traditional comic style mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a book with right yeah. Um, yeah. but there is nothing wrong with that no. and the art is great and all of the books are fully illustrated she also has um these are also online she okay. goes to go comics i think but if you google phoebe and her unicorn you can find them online so that's great um, that might be for our audience perhaps even easiest pin it to your Pin it to your Google, you know, web browser bar, and then go to Phoebe and her unicorn every day. Read, read a new comic. Um, yeah. I <laughs> love them. I discovered her a few like um, at my last job a few years ago, and they're just they're a hoot, and they're great. And especially in this time of chaos, I feel like we all need something yeah. fun but clever, and it's very very clever and. 
Well, thank you for that recommendation. I've certainly processed many of Phoebe and her unicorn comic books for you guys, and I have actually not opened other than cursory glances. I've not read any of them, so um, I will have to do that. And I am not a person who is actually um, naturally drawn to the pink and sparkly. If that's your thing, go for it. This is not a judgmental statement, just me, myself. But this does not surprise me about you, Audrey, that you yes. do not I'm go for that. I'm a bit of a tomboy, but Phoebe and her unicorn is amazing. It's just really, really I love it. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you for being on here. I'm sorry you didn't get to, I know I haven't seen it, but I'm sure Audrey has a pile of books like this tall next to her. about 10. Well, how about we do this? How about we do like that other thing the other week? We'll add it. We'll add it to the, either the probably the comments and the description of this video. If you can put them in a Word document that we'll put on there somehow. Do you want to do that, Audrey? Or we can just talk another time, whatever. Either way, either way, if you put them in a list, we can add we can add them to here so people can see what you had what you had to recommend. Sure. Um, and we would love that. So thank you for being on. And until next time, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Okay. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.